purport. And he elaborates on it. So you're getting, the Prabhupada did, did this and he said this, but he also said that in the Bhagavatam and he also said that elsewhere. And there's also another pastime that relates to this. So you're getting one pastime that expands. So you're getting a broader understanding. So that's really nice. And the other thing that he does is, I don't know if it was consciously or just it happened that way. Much of what is in his book is really the essence of what Prabhupada is, stands for and what Prabhupada teaches. So, which is what I try to do. And so you really, you really get much of the essence of Prabhupada, which is very important for us to understand. Who was Prabhupada? What did he emphasize most? What was most important? What wasn't important? Like that. So it really comes through that book. So I believe it's called Without Fear by Rupa Vilas. Yeah, there it is on Amazon. <clears throat> Without Fear, yeah. I recommend that book. It'll really, it'll help you. I think it'll help you perhaps more than the other bi biographies understand, well, I, I can't say all the essence of Prabhupada, but many, many of the essences of what Prabhupada stood for in his presentation of Krishna consciousness in the, in, to us, which is important for us, right? And um, it's very good also if you're going to teach Krishna consciousness, because there, there's so much there that you can emphasize. And one of the one of the exciting things that I read in the book was exactly what I spoke about a few days ago. It was like there it was right there. This is exactly what I spoke about. And uh, in reflecting on on that, actually there are many things in the book that I speak about regularly. And one of the things I realized is that if you study Prabhupada deeply, you study his books deeply you will pretty much end up preaching everything he preaches pretty much in the same way he does because you, you imbibe it so much. So whenever that happens, whenever I see Prabhupada speaking about something and I can say, ah, oh, that's exactly what I said. I mean, I'm only repeating, but I wasn't repeating it from that particular lecture, just repeating it from the general instruction of Prabhupada. I always feel like, yes, Prabhupada's under my skin. We want to get Prabhupada's teachings under our skin so much so that whenever we speak, we just represent him unconsciously. We, we don't even, we, we're not even representing a particular lecture or purport, but a body of instruction. So that was exciting for me today because it was, it was almost like I was reading a book that I wrote. <laughs> it was really, it's really nice. So it was just, it was just um, making me realize that when you study Prabhupada, when I say study him deeply, I mean study him deeply to understand what essentially is he giving. When you read Prabhupada like that, his instructions and his pastimes, then it becomes more and more clear what is his mission, what, what are the essentials of his teachings, where he's trying to bring us, where he's trying to take us away from directions we shouldn't go, things of that nature. Hare Krishna. And one other thing I want to say, I don't know if this relates to you, but I, I may have told you this story. It's called the hatchet story. Did I tell the story about the hatchet and uh, devotee offering obeisances to Prabhupada? This is told. Uh, I'm telling this story because I see. I just noticed this happening a lot. So every time Shruti Kirti would come in Prabhupada's room, even if he was just going to the kitchen and coming back, he would pay obeisances. That was a standard that Prabhupada had set. Come in, you pay obeisances. You leave before you leave, you pay obeisances. Wherever temple room, whenever you see Prabhupada. So he would come in, let's say, like with a plate, and put it down and pay obeisances, and those obeisances would last like three seconds. Blah, 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 or he wouldn't even say anything, just bow down, get up, serve Prabhupada. Obviously, he didn't want Prabhupada to wait, but 
it's quite often that, um, you know, somebody just comes in the temple, Hare Krishna, you know, pays obeisances. You ever seen that? Just bow down. And three seconds later, they're up. And you wonder what mantra they were chanting. And if you could get that mantra, because it would save you time in the down position. Of course, being down is nice. That's actually where we belong. So, um, Prabhupada said, what is this hatchet? And Shruti Kirti didn't understand. What do you mean this hatchet? And so you're going down, up and down like that in three seconds. He said, no, you should pay proper obeisances. So, Namo Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Shami Tinamani Namaste Sharashwati Deve Gauravani Pracharini Nirvisesa Sindhivari Paschari how long did that take? 11 seconds? Nine seconds? So you save, you save like eight sentences, eight seconds in like disrespect Prabhupada. No, you don't want to do that, right? So I've just been noticing devotees doing this all the time. They come in the temple, they bow down. Sometimes, you know, you can bow down on five limbs, two knees, two feet, two hands. No, two hands two knees, and one head. That's five. Yesterday, I saw one do it on four. He had one knee. He just came in, and like he broke the record for the fastest obeisances. It was like a half a second. He just came in, lifted one leg up, and just came down. And you know, He didn't want to miss the lecture, I guess. So, But I've been noticing this, this like all the time. Like practically half the devotees are coming in the temple, and within two, two, three seconds, they're up. So I just thought, thought I would mention that, that uh, this is not proper. And the other thing that Prabhupada said is when you say obeisances, it shouldn't be like, it should be out loud. You should actually say it out loud. Namao Om, not like in your head or whisper so only your two ears can hear. He said, no, it should be said loudly. And if you can pay dandavats, that's better. Of course, there's some controversy about women doing dandavats. Uh, so whatever the protocol is in your country, temple, you should follow. But um, for men, you can do dandavats, that's if possible. Um, except in Mayapur, when there's 40,000 people in the temple and everyone who pays dandavats you, you, and you're trying to get out of the temple, you have to walk on everyone's back to get out. So I always found that a little awkward. You know, in a temple, a crowded temple room, everyone wants to pay dandavats during Premadwani or, you know, after Jai Radha Madhava, it's not practical. But anyway, that has nothing to do with today's class, but I just wanted to mention that because I'm seeing it quite often. All right, so um, in the interest of time, I think I'll go straight to the article and I just have to bring the article up. I don't have it up at this moment. Um, so I gave a definition of spiritual bypassing in the ad, but um, I will give a definition again. I think the definition is in the article, but I'll give you a brief definition just to make it clear. And this article, um, as far as I know, this article was written by Ram Baru. Prabhu of Karuna Care. And she quotes in this article a Buddhist practitioner who's also a psychotherapist. And he's making some observations which are similar, if not identical, to what goes on in our organization. So, this term, spiritual bypassing, was a term that a, I believe, a psychotherapist came up with. And it was to describe a phenomenon that he was noticing, and I don't think it's just in Hindus or Buddhists. A phenomenon that he was noticing is that people would avoid dealing with problems, relational problems, interpersonal problems, which could be psychological, emotional, um, certain aspects of our conditioning, addictions, etc. They would avoid them in the name 
of just following sadhana. Well, I'll do my sadhana, and my sadhana will solve the problem. And what he noticed that in many cases, it was a way of avoidance. So you're, you're avoiding dealing with the problem. You know how um, it's our nature to avoid dealing with problems which are uncomfortable. So most people, just most people, unless they've trained themselves, when they have very uncomfortable feelings, or very difficult problems which they feel they can't face or overwhelming or addictions tend to just avoid dealing with them because it's it's too difficult to deal with. They feel they'll fail or it's just uncomfortable um, or you have to acknowledge that you're failing <clears throat> or there's so many toxic emotions connected with that feeling, you'd rather not go there. And sometimes you think, well, it's not proper to feel that way because I'm a devotee, so I'm not going to allow myself to feel. So there, there, there may be some justification, but that's the basic idea of spiritual bypassing. And we, we have discussed this before, <clears throat> because the perennial question comes up is, is, if a devotee develops all good qualities, then does he have to work on specific problems individually? And from what Srila Prabhupada says and what the Bhagavatam says, at least as a, a, with a cursory study of it, it seems like, no, you just have to do Krishna consciousness, all these other problems will solve themselves. <clears throat> and I've been asked this question many times, and, and therefore I've, ha I've had to think about it many, many times, because every time I'm asked the question, it sparks perhaps a different way of looking at it. And I think the best answer that I have given, and I've given many, is it's a self-evident answer. So someone says, someone might say, I have this addiction, whatever the addiction might be. It could be to potato chips. It could be to addiction just to being honored and praised. A codependency. You don't have any determination or self-will. You need to be prodded. Or it could be something bigger, sexual addiction alcohol, drug addiction is. It's the same principle in addiction. So the question will be, do I need to do anything? Won't the process of Krishna consciousness solve this problem? And so the next question I would ask is, well, how long have you had this problem and how long have you been a devotee? And someone might say, well, I've been a devotee 20 years and I still have this problem. And I would say, well, doesn't that answer your question? Now, in textbook theory, you could say, yes, it will solve the problem if you are on a very high level of Krishna consciousness, because, you, because obviously a person on a high level of Krishna consciousness would not be addicted, right? That doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> but obviously, if a person has that problem, there are a couple of things going on. Uh, one of them probably is it's a very deeply rooted problem because that's why Krishna consciousness alone hasn't helped it. Whereas for many people, they come to ISKCON with some problems and the problems go away. Now, there's another situation. They go away as brahmacharis. They move out of the brahmachari ashram, the problems come back. This is also common. So in that sangha, in that ideal environment, they were able to, they didn't give in to their problems because they were surrounded by other people who didn't have those problems or had, who had those problems less than them. So you could say, okay, in, a, in an ideal environment, or they move to Mayapur, Vrindavan, and the problem goes away because the environment is so supportive of their spiritual life. So, you, you know, you can't generalize. But so that's why I asked the question, well, how long have you been a devotee? Do you still have the problem? If they say yes, then I would say, well, doesn't that answer your question? because you're asking, won't the spiritual process cure it? And, and all we can say is, well, the level of your spiritual process hasn't cured it. And you therefore, you're therefore, your spiritual life is, it's a paradox or it's a vicious cycle because your spiritual life is suffering because you have the problem, which means you can't go high enough in your spiritual life to solve the problem because the problem is bringing you down. You understand? It's like a, let me say vicious circle. So a lot of devotees don't want to confront that or admit that. 
but you know, but there in the Shastra, it says if you if you are Krishna conscious, okay, if you are Krishna conscious, but this problem is preventing you from becoming Krishna conscious, like you have to look at it that way. And that's why the problem's still there. So if so, then I asked them, what would your spiritual look life look like if you didn't have this problem? And immediately they say, Oh, it would be amazing. Okay, so maybe maybe then you could understand that it's important to eliminate this problem. And if you weren't able to eliminate it through just your sadhana, maybe you should think of eliminating, eliminating it other ways. And then the next thought is, is that allowed? Is that, is that not a deviation from our philosophy <clears throat> that I would depend on something other than Krishna? It's easy to understand if you if you took it as a physical problem. I'm going to the doctor. Oh, Prabhu, you should depend on Krishna. Just chant better rounds, and you know your broken bones will heal. Now, nobody nobody will say that. Although it could be true if you had enough faith that it could happen, but Prabhupada would never tell us that. So no problem going to a doctor, and no one would think that's a lack of faith. So if I need to repair my body, I go to a doctor. It's not against shastra. It's not a, a it's not a symptom that I, la I lack faith. What if I need to repair another problem that's emotional or psychological, that has not been repaired by my level of bhakti? Then is it okay to repair it? Okay, then we'll say yes, it's okay. But the methods with with which you repair it are different than what the doctor uses, because the doctor could be an atheist. But if the the, the psychological work I do is based on atheism and secular humanism, then it's going to contaminate us. Okay, that's true, but it, but much of it isn't, or much of it is not, a, it's not it doesn't even deal with that. So, um, so the idea of spiritual bypassing was, was just, okay, sometimes a devotee sincerely believes that I just have to be more Krishna conscious and the problem will be solved. And I'm not saying that's universally wrong. That is our philosophy. But sometimes the problem is just too deep. If you know anything about addictions, addictions are not simple things to overcome. Even addiction to eating potato chips at midnight, if any of you have that addiction, even that is difficult to overcome. Right. I, I went to the doctor and the doctor told me you should not take any grains or any sweets. I'm like, OK, you know, so. That's a little difficult. That's not a big thing. Right. But, you know, I've been eating grains and sweet. sweet. What does sweet mean? Dates are sweets. Fruits are sweets. You know, no, no, you can't have any of that. Well, we found monk sugar is OK, so I'm all right. But um, and no grains, eating a lot of buckwheat and quinoa and like that. So you know the body's used to eating the grains, but um, I can't. My body's my candida feeds on the grains, so I have to stop, which is good. Keeps me more awake. But even something little like that, you know, you're used to it. It's not easy. It's wired in the brain. If you've ever tried to stop something, you know how difficult it is, right? Um, I think some of us are also wired um, to get upset about things that we really shouldn't get upset about. We become angry about things when they don't go our way. It's just, these are patterns and they're deeply rooted. And so uh, we see sometimes that very advanced devotees still have these patterns and sometimes these patterns disturb their relationships and their ability to serve. And a lot of the a lot of the emotional, psychological issues that we have, we're not aware of until we go into close relationships or till, until we um, start dealing with deeply rooted fears, hesitations, or start, wondering, why is it that I always fail at this? Or, or why does this pattern keep happening? We become introspective and we start to notice things about ourselves. But um, it comes up terribly when you get married. Because marriage is like a mirror, and you start, you're like forced to see yourself, or any kind of close relationship, or when you become a leader, because people are more sensitive to the relationships you they have with you, because leaders can really inspire and really discourage. 
based on their nature. So if, if you're a leader, you're very kind, understanding, empathic, loving, it inspires the people that you're leading. If you're, if you're sarcastic, condescending, overly strict, people will leave you. They won't want to work with you. They'll just complain about you. So you start to notice these things that maybe you didn't notice before when you weren't in that situation. And then um, at that point, if you ignore it, if you deny it, if you don't introspect, you don't want to work on it, and you just think, um, whatever the problem is, I'm a devotee, that's spiritual bypassing. Does that make sense to all of you? You can ask a question now before we go on. I just that was just to give a definition. And maybe some of you can relate. Um, part of spiritual bypassing can, can deal with um, ignoring, ignoring our own nature, ignoring what's going on inside of us. I think, I think as conditioned souls, we're, we we tend to not want to see the worst in us. And some of us cannot see the worst in us because we don't have enough self-esteem to do it. So we just shut down. You know, If someone's trying to point out you could improve in this, a lot of us will shut down because it makes us feel so much like, we already feel like a failure and that makes us feel worse. So we shut it down. Um, all right, so I want to begin reading because the, the way this article is written, it's, it's much more articulate than, than I could be on this topic. Are you ready? Are you ready to face reality? There's always the leave button if I, this puts you in anxiety. But if you leave, you're never going to solve this problem. Okay, so the person who uh, she's quoting is a man named John Wellwood, W-E-L Wood, if you want to do further investigation. Buddhist teacher and psychotherapist John, oh, well, I guess that's two L's. It's spelled wrong in one place. Wellwood noticed a widespread tendency to use spiritual ideas and practices to sidestep or avoid facing unresolved emotional issues, psychological wounds, and unfinished developmental tasks. <clears throat> so this, this could mean that you know you have a problem and you don't think you need to deal with it. You just think the spirit, you, and you use the spiritual process, detachment. Detachment is a great way to sidestep. Did you know that? Detachment is good, but detachment can also be used um, to avoid, uh, to avoid. Just I'm just transcending. I'm de too detached and transcendental. Uh, and um, I've dealt with devotees like that. They're, we call them avadutes. They're just, they're not fully on this plane. And when you try to explain that the problems, the difficulties they're having, they're creating for other devotees. This is like, they're too detached and transcendental, quote unquote transcendental, not actually, but um, to be able to understand it. This is also a, system, a, a symptom of narcissism. So I'm not gonna say that they're narcissistic, but narcissistic people cannot evaluate themselves. They can only evaluate other people. <laughs> That's what they do. So. If you if if a narcissistic person comes in, um, you know, for marriage counseling, and 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 someone tries to point out that there's something they're doing wrong, it immediately they'll turn it against the spouse. That's that's just what they do. So, but not everyone who does that is narcissistic. But sometimes, in the name innocently of detachment, we may just. We, we just, we, we can't, we can't understand the problem. I mean, that's the best way to say it. We just don't understand there is a problem because we just think, oh, that's material, that's mundane. You don't have to transcend it. You know, I'm transcendental, I'm being transcendental. Now what they're oftentimes doing is they're turning off their emotions so they just can't feel anything. So they don't know 
how how they're hurting themselves, how hurt they feel, or how they're hurting other people, or how bad it is. It's kind of like a numbing, detachment, numbing. Have you ever seen that or have done that yourself? Yeah, it's it's also a coping mechanism for neophyte devotees because uh, you kind of the the path is so new. You always don't know how to deal with it, and so if you don't know how to deal with it, just kind of numb yourself you know that then your numbing is is your detachment right you don't feel anything what is the best way to deal with a narciss narcissist um whatever direction he's walking walk the other way um that's my understanding that you uh, the symptom of being narcissistic is that you you cannot explain that to them and if they ever come to understand it and they go to a psych psychotherapist, that psychotherapist is going to make a lot of money because it's going to take him or her years to cure them. And the psychotherapist is probably going to go completely crazy in the process of trying to cure them because they have a hard time admitting. Huh? It's unfortunate. It's not good for spiritual life to be narcissistic because you have to be introspective. And narcissistic people, they can see the faults of others. They can't see their own, unfortunately. They tend to be very selfish. Um, here's, here's an example of a narcissistic person. You may have seen this, or um, I don't want to call anybody out, but a narcissistic person if they do something good, they'll definitely have their camera there so they can show the video on wherever they want to show it, right? Like they're going to do some charity, but they'll make a video because they it's more important to be recognized for the good work than actually do the good work. Not very good for spiritual life, is it? Yeah, so there's a lot. Of I mean, I think I think Krishna consciousness has actually cured a lot of narcissistic people, and I think it's actually made some narcissist, narcissistic people more narcissistic, depending on who they are and the position they're in. But, you know, Krishna consciousness is all about being selfless, being compassionate, being empathetic. So, you know, we're in a good position. But um, if someone doesn't take Krishna consciousness properly, they can use Krishna consciousness to foster their own their own illness, mental illness, because they get power control. Um, you can put yourself in positions or you demand affection. You know, it's, you know, if a narcissistic person becomes a guru, it's very destructive. Because if you don't love them, they'll hate you. And we had gurus like that. Fortunately, Krishna took them out because it didn't work. But if you didn't love them, they would basically ask you to leave their zone. Hare Krishna. So, you know, everything is dangerous when you go up. Any, any illness you have, psychological, emotional, or deeply rooted conditioning, <clears throat> it becomes extremely dangerous when you have more power. And so as you go up, you have more power. So as you become a leader, you have to be healthy. Otherwise, you'll misuse it because <clears throat> it's such a good opportunity. Uh, so, okay, <clears throat> we're going to go slowly through this because I want to like open it up. And um, at, at one thing that's really important, you probably understand this, but when we're talking about these things, you know, there's a tendency to think, oh yeah, that reminds me of so-and-so, Mataji, you know, instead of, so, you know, I'm not saying you're spiritually bypassing or you're a psychopath or narcissistic or you have borderline personality disorder. Or, and I'm not saying any of that, although you might. <laughs> but these, this class is, is for you to see if you're spiritually bypassing, not to see if everyone in your temple is and to tell them tomorrow or send them an email after this class. You're spiritually bypassing, Mataji. And I'm going to fix you. Yeah. So that that's part of our disease. You know, uh, make a list of all the people you want to fix. You'd probably have a long list, right? 
I want to fix my temple president, my GBC, uh, this one, that one, head Bujari, I don't like really do art. You know, we want to fix the whole world. Um, Prabhu, what about you? Uh, no, I'm fine. <laughs> so that's the problem, right? So when we give these classes, we want to look at everything in terms of ourselves, right? So really, really, when we talk about this, it's all about introspection. Am, am, I, am I avoiding anything that I'm afraid to deal with and just saying, oh, if I just chant Hare Krishna, it'll solve it. In theory, yes. <clears throat> and it'll help it. There's no question. Will it solve it? Go back to the question. Has it solved it yet? That's the answer. All right. If you've only been a devotee three days, maybe you need more time. But most of you have been around enough to know that the spiritual process has or hasn't solved particular problems. Obviously, it solves lots of problems. But um, we're deeply conditioned. And when it comes to relationships, that's when the conditioning is most evident. You agree? I didn't know how messed up I was until I had this intimate relationship. Then it all became evident that I'm a, I'm a this, this, and this. Because my partner is always saying, why are you so much like this? Why do you always do this? Why can't you do? And then you start to realize, oh, I do that? I never noticed. Of course you never noticed. You lived alone. <clears throat> or you live with some friend who didn't care. Yeah, because they weren't married to you. Right? <clears throat> so most people will notice these things as they get older. But it's, I always feel it's unfortunate you don't notice it till you're like 50 because you just live 50 years with it. You know, it would have been better to notice it as soon as you could notice it and deal with it. Most people, most people get a little reflective when they hit middle age because they look in the mirror one day and go, I'm a mess. And that was hard to admit when they were 20 because, you know, the, at 20, your ego was like the size of, you know, 20, 25 planets put together. But when you get older, it's like, okay, my life's pretty messed up. You know, maybe there's something wrong with me. Yeah, just maybe. Yeah. And so you start to, you know, it doesn't take to your 50. Some people do it when they're younger. But then when you solve it, then you have a better life because you don't have to live with it. And your Krishna consciousness gets easier. And you become more self-accepting, self-compassionate. You become better association for devotees. You can also help devotees who have the same problem. It's just, it's just good to be introspective. And Krishna uses this word, the introspective sage. And we were, we were having a meeting about leadership with some of devotees who are therapists. And everyone agreed that introspection is a fundamental quality of a leader. They have to be able to see their lackings. Essential. It's essential so they can improve. Because you and I maybe have problems, but when we become leaders, we have to work on those problems. Because those, uh, we're, to be a leader, there's a demand. I don't want to say demand to be perfect, but at least to be better, at least to be exemplary in many ways. And even, even if you have many problems, at least if you're working on them and you admit them, that's also leadership because then what you do, the people under you will do. And if you're not vulnerable and introspective, most of them won't be either because they won't think that's what you're supposed to do because they don't see you doing it. Right? Leaders create the culture. And as I've often said, if you stay devotees long enough, you will be a leader. As soon as your hair turns gray, you are now officially inaugurated in the senior category. Oh, she's a senior devotee. How do you know? Her hair's gray. That's how I know. They, they won't even care how long you've been a devotee. Your hair turns gray, you're a senior devotee. You know. and, and what does senior mean? Well, I joined yesterday and you joined three years ago. You're a senior for me. So you don't even have to be gray. All of you are thinking, well, that's a relief. I won't be gray for 20 years. Yeah, but to the, well, the devotee who just joined yesterday, you're a senior, right? Even though you don't feel like it. Even though you're not initiated, you're still a senior. Sorry for the bad news, ladies and gentlemen, but that's just how it is. So, you know. Okay, so 
look at what we're talking about in terms of yourself. And if you want to look at it in terms of others, look at it in terms of understanding this for yourself and understanding how you could use this information to help others, not to condemn, because that's always a problem when you learn the information which you learn, which could be used to help people, oftentimes is used to condemn people. Have you ever done that? You come out of Bhagavatam class and now you're like condemning every devotee that you see for not being the way the speaker said we're supposed to be, instead of understanding the knowledge so you could help them and help yourself. Correct? Correct. Verda. Acha. Satyam. Satyam he. Da. What else? What else we got here? That's about it. I think I covered all of you, right? If someone's from Lithuania, I don't know how to say it there. Oh, we might have some, yeah. I don't know. Okay. Okay. So this is John Wellwood explaining um, what he just explained, which was that people use the spiritual process to sidestep the emotional issues and their past conditioning and just, you know, maturing emotionally or you could say, you know, just healing, healing wounds that can make their life more difficult, make their relationships difficult, even make just their determination to be devotees difficult. Because psychological, sometimes, you know, psychological problems is like, oh, every time I do this, I fail. So why, why, do, why should I even try again? What's the use? I might as well give up. That's a psychological problem that has caused many devotees to give up. Whereas the same devotee with the same problem, with the same level of execution, the same number of fall downs, can process it totally in a totally different way and eventually become successful because of a different psychological framework. So that's how important it is to be psychologically healthy. And devotees say, yeah, we don't need psychology. You're like, well, you have one. So it's not a question of you need it or you don't, you have it. So we need a healthy psychology, right? And if you don't have a healthy psychology, it can negatively impact your bhakti. Even though you're chanting your rounds and going to class, um, if, if you have low self-esteem, you will tend to criticize more than people who don't have low self-esteem. It's just the way it is. Because people who are better than you put you in anxiety, it makes you feel bad, and you need to pull them down so they're no longer better than you. Right? Or if you have if you have if you're narcissistic. You need to tell everybody about how great you are and how great everything you do is. Yeah, you know what I just did? You know, it was so great. You know, you, you don't care what anyone else did. You just want to tell everybody what you did. That is called pride in our philosophy, right? So it's not good for a spiritual life. So you can go down and look at unhealthy psychology and see how it manifests as like so many different kinds of anarthas. Pride, criticism, lack of determination. So if people say, well, Psychology is not important. It, no, it is. Good psychology is important. It can make a difference in your spiritual life. Right? Just like if you have a sick body, it's hard to be Krishna conscious. Okay, he explains. When we are spiritually bypassing, we often use the goal of awakening or liberation. We could just say, for us, Krishna consciousness. This is in a Buddhist context to rationalize premature transcendence. That's a, a, a nice word to remember. Prabhu, I think you're prematurely transcending. What does premature transcendence mean? It means you're trying to be someone you are not, and you are thinking you are someone you're not. And you're doing things that are not sustainable for your level of advancement and realization. Like, you know, the 19-year-old who's been a devotee for three days, who's asking the TP if he can take sannyas. 
Well, I think you're prematurely transcendental, Prabhu. Okay, well, of course, of course, that's obvious. It's not always so obvious. But um, here's here's the question to ask yourself in, in terms of any kind of austerity or any ashram or varna or any endeavor you want to make, increasing the number of your rounds, increasing the number of your austerities. Just ask yourself, is this sustainable? Now, like, for example, during Kartik, you might want to do a vow for a month, and, that, and that's recommended. But I'm talking about in general. So if you're thinking, you know, I should do this or shouldn't do this, ask yourself the question, is this sustainable? Will I be able to do this every day? Because you don't want to be a yo-yo. So, I, well, I want to chant 25 rounds. Okay, can you do that every day now? Because you don't want to do 25 tomorrow and 14 the next day. No, better you do 16 every day or 18 every day or 21 every day. Do what you can maintain. So premature transcendence is both you will, eff, you will make an effort to do what's not sustainable and you will think you are more transcendental than you actually are. And I think premature transcendence is a natural disease that new devotees have unless they are helped by senior devotees to bring, bring them back into the real world. They will tend to uh, think they're more advanced than they are. Here's another thing. A lot of us think we're more advanced than we are because we have, we have really good association. And when you have good, really good association, your advancement is coming as much or more from the people around you than from yourself. So you think, wow, I'm so strong. I'm so powerful. Yeah, well, look who's your association. You're like you live with like 10 sannyasis. Of course you feel renounced. Yeah, you know. Well, what happens when you go home to mama? Then, you, you know, you're, you're watching movies, Netflix all day, you know, 24-7. So sometimes you, it, it's hard to evaluate yourself when you're in an ideal environment because that environment is holding you up. So, you know, sustainable in all environments, not just when I'm living with 10 sannyasis in Vrindavan and I feel like, you know, Maya can't touch me. Yeah, okay. When you go home to mama, what about that? Can you sustain it there? Sustain it in Brahmacharya Ashram, sustain it as a great hostage. That's what it means, sustainable. That you can do this always. That's your level. Naturally, you can be on a higher level in an ideal situation, but what's the midline level that you can sustain? Hare Krishna. Okay. Is that clear to you? Does that make sense? It's just, just the word sustainable, is a, it's a really a magical word. I'm going to go to Vrindavan and do bliss and that. Okay, for three months? All right, fine. I'm going to do that the rest of my life. Really? You could hardly get out of bed before four o'clock, Prabhu. How are you going to do that now? I'm going to do it. You know, it's like, so um, is that sustainable? How, how would you know it's sustainable? You've never even done it yet, right? So sometimes you, you may have to try something. Okay, okay, I'll try 25 rounds for a month. Let me see if I can do it. If I can't, I'll go back to 16. If I can, I'll decide if it's sustainable. Then I'll do it. Okay, let's continue reading. Premature transcendence, defined as trying to rise above the raw and messy side of our humanness before we have fully faced and made peace with it. Ah, you like that one? I'm going to copy that and put it in the chat. That was a good one. So you have to go to the bottom of the chat now to see this. Trying to rise above the raw and messy side of our humanness before we have fully faced and made peace with it. That's a good definition. And that goes back to what we originally said. This is a lot easier than dealing with it, right? Just to say, I can transcend it. Then I don't have to deal with it. <clears throat> so you're using transcendence as a way of avoidance. That's spiritual bypass. When actually you can't transcend it, that's the point. If you could transcend it, then it's not a problem. But when you, this, he's making the assumption that you won't, for most conditioned souls, they won't be able, able 
to transcend their conditioned nature without having dealt with it and you know healed it in some way or acknowledged it and, and worked on it. Have any of you ever noticed how weird you are? If you haven't, come stay with me and I'll tell you how weird you are. Um, so, um, we're all weird, some in a good way, right? Some of us are weird in a good way. But we have, we have a certain nature, right? And, and some of that nature we have is not good for devotional service. It's not inherent. It's not inherently the quality of a devotee. I was, a devotee asked me a question. I want to read this question to you. Let's give me one moment. Here's the question. How can we turn pain into love? And I spontaneously said, every situation is an opportunity to love. I think Krishna made me say that because I never really thought of that. Every so think about it, right? Like if you if you are Krishna conscious, how would you respond? Like, look at how did Prabhupada respond? He always responded with compassion, right? Devotee would do something wrong. Okay, let's correct it and let's go on. Here's your service, continue. And then Prabhupada would encourage them or give them the sauce, which is a form of encouragement. You know the sauce? Do you understand the sauce? You Russians, do you understand the sauce? What the sauce is? <clears throat> it's when you when somebody's very heavy with you. In, in, in American English, we say, you gave them the sauce, like the hot sauce. You know? um, so now th think of how you respond to various situations, and you will notice patterns, certain patterns. And some of the responses are really healthy, and some may not be healthy. And you ever respond to a situation like, Nobody loves me. Everybody's against me. You know? Well, that's not very good for Krishna consciousness because now you think all the devotees hate you. And uh, it's not good to have that attitude towards devotees. And then you become quite, what's used to going on? Nobody cares. Whatever I do, they just criticize. You know, you know that attitude. Have you seen that? Um, that's just a pattern, right? That's just a pattern that we grew up with. So we all have patterns. So, so what he's saying is like, if you're going to carry patterns and avoid them, it's just going to make it difficult for you in your spiritual life. <clears throat> and I think some devotees will say, but, but isn't dealing with those patterns a compromise of our spiritual life? Well, the thing is that there, there are ways to deal with things that don't require necessarily anything other than Krishna consciousness, but it requires a specific focused approach of Krishna consciousness to that problem. Not just, well, I do sadhana and that's it. No, but I, I need to understand how Krishna consciousness applies to this particular problem, right? So if we, if we just use the example that we just gave, everyone's against me, everyone's this and that, how could we resolve that with Krishna consciousness? Well, we, we could understand, no, Krishna loves me, my guru loves me, I'm just looking at the negative side of things rather than the positive. I mean, even though that's spirituality, it's still borderline psychology because the psychologist would tell you the same thing, see the good in everyone, etc. right? So sometimes you can't distinguish between Krishna consciousness and psychology. They're just basically often merged together. It's because... Krishna consciousness means to control the mind. So sometimes philosophy addresses how to deal with the mind. So, but in some cases, like if we're dealing with deep addictions or deeply conditioned responses to things, that it, it may require more of a psychological approach. But Krishna consciousness has so much to heal us, even if we're using these other forms. Uh, I've seen that because the heart is more open and soft and we're more, we have more invested interest in changing. So Krishna consciousness helps us.
and our devotion to Prabhupada, devotion to our guru. We want to do this to be better for our spiritual master. So we have a lot of impetus also, right? And plus the prize, going back to Godhead, you know, we don't want to give up on that so easily. Maybe, you know, I, in the material world, I would give up on something, but now you have this goal. This is not something to easily give up on. Okay, so we have, we have a human side. It may need some healing. It may need some recalibrating. There may be some past conditioning that is affecting us presently. And we think, who cares? I'll just chant and dance and not worry about it. Well, if you could chant and dance 24 seven and only stop to take prasadam, then you wouldn't have to worry about it because it wouldn't really be a problem because there'd be no way to manage those those dysfunctions wouldn't have any way to manifest. And a lot of us, when we were new devotees, that's all we did. We just did kirtan all day. So we, you know, if we had problems, it, it, it couldn't really manifest because we just go out, get in the van and you know, get up for Mangal Arati, do the whole program, clean the temple, get in the van, go out and hurry now, come back, sit in Bhagavad Gita class, read Krishna book, have some hot milk and you fall asleep. You know, that was it. So there wasn't time to have problems, even if you did. They could have manifest. There was no, there was no like place to plant them. So that's true. If you're if you are that engaged, then even if you had problems, it wouldn't be a problem because there's no, you know, it, there wouldn't be a lot of ways those problems could be a problem for you or be a problem for others. Could be a problem for others sometimes, but if most of the time you're doing kirtan, generally during kirtan, we're not really problems for one another. Or maybe we're, we'll never be a problem for one another when we're doing kirtan. Unless a devotee's leading kirtan, you go, he's proud, he's puffed up, he's just singing to attract the girls. You could think like that, of course. But generally during kirtan, those kinds of thoughts are minimized, aren't they? I hope. Okay. So he says, trying to rise above the raw and messy side of our humanness before we have fully faced and made peace with it. That's a definition. And then we tend to use absolute truth to disparage or dismiss relative human needs, feelings, psychological problems, relational difficulties, and development mental deficits. Deficits, excuse me. Wellwood saw this to be an occupational hazard of the spiritual path, and that spirituality has a vision of going beyond our current karmic situation. So, as I was saying, I, I've noticed that when someone becomes a devotee, there's certain things they think, certain things they go through. Here he calls it an occupational hazard. When you go on the spiritual path, there will be a tendency to want to ignore everything about yourself <laughs> in the effort to transcend it. Now, here's, here's an interesting thing, and this is why this is a problem. Didn't you all join to run away from your problems? I'll just become a devotee and take prasadam chant. Then, so it's like the very reason we joined then becomes the problem. <laughs> Isn't it? Isn't that interesting? So, but anyway, it's good to be aware of this. It's good we're talking about it. So, you know, I'm just going to become a devotee. You know why I became a devotee? Because I didn't want to work. The idea of working was like, for me, it was like, that was about the worst thing I could ever do with my life is work. <laughs> and so um, that wasn't the only reason I became a devotee, but it was de definitely a very strong pushing. It's like, well, if I do this, it solves that problem. Right? I won't have to work, right? And then you become celibate, so it solves that whole problem, you know, dealing with the opposite sex, which is not easy, at least not for me. So, so I just become a brahmachari, solve that one. Become a devotee, you don't have to worry about your career and work and money. And um, just go out and chant all day. Sounds good. I can do that. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. We'll read your comments soon. I'll, I'll stop in about five minutes. So he's saying um, we use the philosophy to say, you know, I go to you and say, Prabhu, I, 
I really feel like I have this need that's not being fulfilled. And I feel like it's up, you know, it's I'm living a very unbalanced life now because I need to fulfill this. And then the devotee says, it's just Maya Prabhu. It's because you're making offenses to the holy name. That's why you feel this way. If you were Krishna conscious, you wouldn't feel that way. So then you think, okay, I just have to be more Krishna conscious. And then I just think that's Maya. So there's two problems here. One problem is that you feel that way. Um, you don't understand, you know, so you feel like, oh, maybe, maybe these, these needs, these feelings, I should just not worry about them. It's just Maya. Because that's kind of maybe how you put two and two together from hearing classes and so forth. You put two and two together, you come up with five, so you feel this way. But the problem is when the, when the preachers put two and two together and come up with five, then it reinforces it. And then you have a problem. Because now you can't really intuitively feel your way around this because you're being preached to that this is Maya to think about these things. It's just your attachment. It's just, it's just your mind. One devotee was experiencing depression and on the and becoming suicidal, and her, and her guru said, well, it's just your mind. Hare Krishna, that is not what you tell someone who's suicidal. It's just your mind. And they're like, yeah, I know. <laughs> so, you know, that it's, it's a lot deeper problem than that, right? This is just, you know, the depression or the suicidal tendency is a manifestation of something deeper. So, um, so that's when it becomes a problem. And I think, I, and I made a video on this. In the video, I said that we, we oftentimes have an intuitive sense of what we need and what we need to avoid, what we need for our spiritual life and what we need for to be materially grounded and healthy. We, we have an intuitive sense. And sometimes someone will recommend you should do something. It just doesn't feel right. And you think, I can't do that, or that's too difficult, or I couldn't sustain that, or that's way goes way against my nature. I would just, I would lose my enthusiasm for bhakti if I did that. And sometimes they're like pushing you. No, you should do that. This is right. And you know, there's there's a resistance, but the resistance is not because you don't want to surrender. The resistance is because you you feel this wouldn't be. It's not going to. It's not going to. It's not going to nourish my spiritual life. I know that. I know myself well enough to know that if I did this, I would just crash, actually. I'd stop coming to the temple or whatever. I'd stop chanting my rounds or I would give up. And then you're in a predicament because your authority is telling you one thing and you are feeling something totally opposite. Now what do you do? It kind of makes you feel like, I wish I could just merge in Brahman right now and then they couldn't find me. Right. Isn't you know, you ever you know so that the, but this is this is real life. This does happen, and it was hard for me to make this video because the conclusion of this video was you should go. In most cases, you should go if if you're certain that going with that instruction will be harmful. Don't go with it. It was hard to say that because it's like I'm minimizing authority, but I've seen it enough that I was convinced that I have reason to say that. So this is when it, when this problem becomes worse, this is when leaders are preaching in a way that are causing you to spiritual bypass. And they don't, they obviously don't know it, otherwise they wouldn't do it. So um, again, if you become a leader, understanding these things is important, understanding the psychology and nature of the people that you're preaching to, the people you're guiding is important. Otherwise, you will tell them to do something that will backfire. It will. It, your intention is that it will help them, but it won't. So, anyway, I think this class will help you kind of understand how to, how to traverse through these situations. So this is the occupational hazard that we want to brush off. Our needs, problems, feelings, relationship problems. As you know, not a big deal. Just just practice Krishna consciousness. It'll all work out. And that you know this these samskaras and past karma and like that. It's 
is having no effect. In in a sense, it has no effect because it's, your past karma is not going to keep you in the material world. But the samskaras obviously have an effect. They're, they're our habits. They are our condition. Okay, so I'm going to read one more thing. Wellwood explains that trying to move beyond our psychological and emotional issues by sidestepping them is dangerous. It sets up a debilitating split between our transcendent self and the human within us, leading to a conceptual one-sided kind of spirituality, where one pole of life is elevated at the expense of its opposite. In other words, I'm trying to elevate my spiritual by minimizing everything else and other things that need to be healed are ignored in the effort to elevate the spiritual, but it never works in the long run because the unhealed other parts of us, the conditioning, it eventually starts to have ill effects on us at some point. Absolute truth is favored over relative truth, the impersonal over the personal, transcendence over embodiment and detachment over feeling. Okay. So I'm going to take, I'm going to look at the chat and see what's in there. And then um, if you want to ask a question or add something, you can, and then we'll see how far we go. And if we finish with the questions, then we will continue reading. So we have a comment from Gabriella who is a psychologist. The first step in starting psychotherapy is for a person to be aware that they have a problem and have the humility to realize that they cannot solve it themselves and that they have not been able to solve it themselves over time. And that's also the first step in the 12-step program. I have a problem I can't solve on my own. Also, at the social level, there is not enough awareness or education about mental health and self-responsibility. I was told that in some countries, there is, um, it's kind of taboo to go to a psychotherapist because psychotherapy equates, um, it means that you're crazy. You've got some serious mental illness. So, you know, your friends find out you're going to a therapist. I'm like, well, then, then it's like saying you're mentally ill. So you would want to avoid it. That's unfortunate. So Jason says, what is the best way to deal with a narcissistic person? Yeah, I already told you. Um, for my study of, well, there's two kinds of, one is narcissistic and one is a personality disorder. And um, one who has the personality disorder is affected by the narcissism. Emotionally affected and they're aware that but a person who's narcissistic in general doesn't feel affected. They, they're fine. The narcissistic personality disorder person feels like there's something wrong. Not necessarily that they're narcissistic, but they're, they're handicapped by it. But um, any, any person who lacks self-awareness, which is what Gabrielle is saying, any person who lacks enough self-awareness to be aware that there's a problem can't be helped. And Prahlad Maharaj said that also. He said, in relation to Krishna consciousness, if you're determined not to be, nobody can help you. And that's true of anything. How could someone help you solve a problem that you won't admit you have? That's like talking to a teenager, basically. And you tell them you, they have a problem, they'll tell you you have a problem. I think all teenagers are narcissistic, right? They have narcissistic tendencies. You shouldn't do that. Will you do it? So it's it's always thrown back. So um, yeah, I think that's the right answer. Um, walk the other direction, or go get prasadam and serve them prasadam. But um, don't think that you're going to help them until they ask you for help, until they realize they need. Can one learn to see one's faults through projections? Yeah. That's, that's, there's an exercise for you. I, this, this is an exercise we sometimes do. So the first question is, do you ever notice the faults in others? Of course, the answer is yes. 
Is it possible, question number two, is it possible that the faults you're noticing in others are your own? Of course. So it's just a, it's a very kind and simple way of making that point. It's like, yeah, of course. And so there's a saying, if you spot it, you got it. <laughs> you tend to spot the faults that you have yourself. You know, and which is why criticism is so autobiographical. And it's like, when someone's very critical, it's like, you're just telling me about yourself. You're not actually <laughs> telling me about that person. And you're kind of embarrassing yourself. I mean, if you understand that, they're embarrassing themselves to you. Um, and, and a lot of people know this. It's like, this person's talking about that person. So I wonder what they're going to say about me when I leave to that person. Now they're going to go to that person and tell them about me, right? You ever thought like that? Yeah. Oh, I miss Greek. Okay, how do you say true in Greek? Ot? Is it ot? Oh, you missed out. They you saying nay. Oh, in Greek it's not nay. Well, that's easy. Same as Hindi. Or maybe it's ni. Hmm. So there's the definition again, trying to rise above the raw and messy side of our humanness before we have fully faced and made peace with it. Don't you think it's easier to deal with leaders who've, who are aware of their own messy side? I think there's a tendency when you're aware of your messy side to be less, um, to, be more, to be more empathetic and sympathetic to other people's messy side because you have it also and you're aware of it. That's why sometimes I, I find it really difficult to chastise my disciples when they make certain mistakes because I've made them also. I'm like, how can I chastise? I made the same mistake when I was their age. I'm so reluctant. It's like, there's like nothing in me that wants to say anything. It's like, I was like well, I did it too. It's just like, it, everybody goes through that. You know, Everybody slips on the banana, pe banana peel sooner or later. So anyway, that's my experience. I probably should chastise more, um, but sometimes it's hard when I know what they're going through because I went through it. Um, Christy says, we often speak about that, this, that most of the devotees come to KC being broken. Yeah. So then we need to educate devotees that yeah, KC is the problem, but you, you, if you're too broken, then, then that brokenness is going to be a problem for you to take up KC. That was the first point I made. KC will solve your problems, but if you're too broken, you won't have enough KC to solve your problems. So you have to solve, solve your brokenness to, let, to be advanced enough to let KC solve the problems. One of, one of the things that I see, which is most unfortunate, is um, how if we have deep scars, psychological scars, it can be really difficult to have good relationships. And good relationships are essential for our spiritual life. And, you know, everybody wants to have loving relationships. Most devotees want to be married, raise family, have loving relationships with their spouse, with their children. But if you're a damaged person, it's extremely difficult to do that. You'll, you'll tend to manifest more anger than love. And I'm just speaking from experience of my wife's marriage counselor. So she has a lot of experience of this, that if, if, if the people have huge issues, personal issues, there's tremendous effects on their relationship. And they may even be compatible people, but the issues prevent them from being able to get along. And they'll always blame. And a sign of, a sign of emotional immaturity is, or a sign you need healing is you'll always blame the other person. Nothing's ever your fault. It's always someone else's fault. And that pretty much is the way to destroy a relationship. I mean, at least statistically speaking, if you want to destroy a relationship, just criticize the other person. And if you want to finish the relationship off, condemn them. That will, that, okay, we have to rephrase that. If you, want to, if you want to make a relationship go bad, criticize. And if you want to destroy it, condemn. That's statistical research. So if your nature is to condemn, 
Do you want you want be able to have a good relationship? Because criticism and condemnation destroy relationships, whether it's between spouses or friends or even guru and disciple. And I've seen devotees who have this nature, and it comes out in every relationship, including the relationship with their guru. So don't don't think your dysfunction won't enter into the guru-disciple relationship. If you're not careful, it will. You'll have all kinds of expectations. You'll be critical of your guru because he said he's going to call you at 6, but he called you at 6.03. How dare he do that? He's minimizing me. Who does he think he is? Can't even keep his word. You know, and you think, oh, you're exaggerating. No, I'm not. There are people like that. So uh, there's a saying, how you do anything is how you do everything, you know. Bad, bad relation with this one, probably with that one, that one, that one, that one. Sometimes not. Sometimes it's just chemistry. But often it's, it's a problem that keeps coming up in all relationships. It's a pattern. Chris Day says, it's a, we get a higher taste, but the psychological problems tend to stay and left unresolved issues unless worked on purposefully. And that's, you know, someone might want to say, well, where's the Shastra for that? And I say, well, I have this Shastra, it's called my window. I just got my window and this is what I see. And if I see it enough, it becomes my Shastra. And Jiva Goswami supports that. If you see that this is what's happening, and you're quoting Shastra to, to, to disprove what's actually happening in the material world, then you need to go see Gabrielle and get your head straightened. No, Jiva Goswami didn't say that. But um, you can't quote Shastra to establish something which doesn't actually happen. It's not, Shastra is describing what happened. So if you think in a way that you're establishing something that that everything you see outside your window goes the opposite way, you probably didn't understand it. Um, Kamal says, what's more dependable, philosophy or religion? Now, it depends what you mean by religion. It depends what you mean by philosophy. Well, um, Prabhupada says they have to go together. Because religion, we would mean is practice and authority. And philosophy, we would say, is using your mental capacities to understand the religious teachings and the practice. So they have to go together. But, um, okay. I'm not sure if that was in relation to what we were discussing, but I, I didn't answer it in relationship to what we were discussing, so maybe I misunderstood the question. Katie says, I feel like trying to explain what it actually means to have a mental health diagnosis to some devotees. It's almost impossible. Yeah, because if you've never had it, then you just think, what, they must think you're in Maya if you try to explain it, right? Not everyone is aware that even something simple as depression or anxiety is a medical condition. Many of those devotees that aren't aware of what it actually is think that there must be something wrong with the way I think, and that's why I am suffering. Not many of them are actually open to the explanation I am thinking that way because of the anatomical anomalies on my brain, which can actually be detected by a scan. A Prabhu once told me that he would make me a tea and give me a biscuit, and then I wouldn't be depressed or anxious, that I must be depressed and anxious because my sadhana is not good, because I don't practice. No, he was wrong. The reason you're depressed is you don't eat enough kulab jamas. That's actually the reason. Um, narcissism is a personality disorder. Having well, it can be both. Having narcissistic traits doesn't mean the person has been people. Yeah, oh yeah. So she's saying you can have narcissistic traits, and it's not a, considered um, a disorder by the medical mental health professionals, unless it's affecting you. If it's affecting you adversely. I mean, you feel it's adversely affecting you, then it's considered narcissistic personality disorder. So what um, Katie is saying is that, um, well, this has been 
discussed. Uh, this was discussed actually among one of the gurus presented this. Uh, he was saying that as leaders, we need to, under, well, like what Katie's saying, we need to understand these things. And I gave a, I gave a, a, a little talk on this called Don't Throw Shlokas at Emotional Problems. Because, you know, we're trained to throw shlokas at things, which is what we should do. But if you're, if you're dealing with an emotional problem, the shlokas aren't necessary. It's not, that's not going to work. I, I would say, Katie, what Katie's saying, probably the most therapeutic thing for her amongst the Vaishnavas is just understanding. That would be the most healing for her. Because people just understood it. So, you know. Um, so if Katie says this, I feel this and that, and so yeah, I understand. You have this problem, I understand it. But then to preach to her, to try to correct it, especially if you didn't ask how I should deal with this, a particular problem, yeah, it's, it doesn't work. It makes it worse. Tanya says, I was just reading how Dhruva Maharaj rejected Narada Muni's instruction because he felt it was clashing with his nature. <laughs> Here it is. Does that mean we can reject our Guru's instruction? My dear Lord Naraji, for a person whose heart is disturbed by material conditions of happiness and distress, whatever you have so kindly explained, for attainment of peace of mind is certainly a very good instruction. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm covered by ignorance and this kind of philosophy does not touch my heart. My Lord, I'm very impudent for not accepting your instruction, but this is not my fault. It's due to my having been born a Chhatriya family. My stepmother, Suruchi, has pierced my heart with her harsh words. Therefore, your valuable instruction does not stand in my heart. Hare Krishna. Well, for all you Chhatris out there, you've got things to work out. Um, I think that's a slightly different situation. It is, a, and it is an example. But... Um, yeah, but it, it is true sometimes that we have a particular nature and we may be instructed against our nature and it doesn't work. But, you know, you can, tell, you can tell the person who gave you the instruction, you know, it's not my nature. I don't think it's going to work. I've done it before. You know, I was ready to hang myself when I had to do this. Like, make me a temple president and then put a, if you're going to make me a temple president, you have to put a rope hanging from a tree in the backyard because that's how it makes me feel. You know, and I know that, and I know it's not sustainable for me because it's not my nature. Well, maybe if you give me a million dollars and 25 devotees and three people to manage the place, yeah, okay, then I can do it. But normally it's not like that when you run a temple. So, but some people love to do that. They love, they love challenges. They love to, you know, make things happen where there's nothing you know, work 15 hours a day. They love it. That's their nature. Okay, we're getting some more information from our in-house psychologist. Statistically, people with narcissistic disorders and psychopathy are more likely to be found in positions of authority in religious movements and as CEOs of large companies because... They are very charismatic and dominant. So how to prevent this from happening in this movement if the leaders are not being psychologically evaluated or do not receive training in these subjects? What can we do? I'm trying to do something. I'm, um, these things are actually being discussed and it's a, quite a sensitive issue. I, th I think it's obvious, but it will be sensitive and the reason it's sensitive is because, according to Shastra, disciples should have a right should have a right to choose any guru they want. And so, you know, the real thing is the disciple has to do their homework. So, if, if a disciple, you know, is attracted to a guru, but they see, oh, he's got some tendencies that seem to make him uh, maybe he wouldn't understand me, or someone like. Um, Katie would think, oh, this guru wouldn't be good for me because he wouldn't understand me. Like that. Well, there was some, some uh, have suggested they take some psychological tests, just, you know, and that can be, you know, on the website. He didn't pass the test. So, you know, he's qualified to teach you Krishna consciousness, but in terms of relationships and that, and maybe, 
you may not want to get too close because he has these tendencies. Um, I will, I will suggest that I don't, I don't remember if I suggested it to the right people, but it, we've talked about it. But I will I'll make a note to suggest it. But um, I just suggested, uh, I, uh, um, I suggested that you know there should be some details about each guru. You know what what they emphasize, what they teach, what they expect, what their nature is. So, because you won't know that, you know, disciples should study his guru. It's said in Shastra, you should live for a year with your guru. Okay, so um, all of you who want to accept a guru should go live with them. No, that's not possible. Especially if you're a woman, how would that be possible? And how would it be practical? You're just gonna get up and fly to the temple that your guru lives in and say, I'm here, where's my room? Actually, I'm supposed to live with you, I guess, in the same room, right? Um, so, um, yeah, so it's not possible. So um, getting more information is, if we can get more information about a guru, and then you can, that's why it's a little sticky. But um, this has been, um, what you suggested, Gabriel, has been suggested by some devotees. And um, I don't, and I'm in a position to suggest it to um, a committee that might be the best committee to enact it. But this discussion has been there. The, all the people in your position, the counselors and therapists, they all think like this because they understand the dangers of misuse of power. And people with certain, certain personality types or disorders can misuse power. Um, and for them, they can still preach Krishna consciousness. It's just when they give practical instructions, sometimes it becomes a problem because they'll be too narrow or strict. And 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 when dealing with people who have, you know, let's say, traumatic pasts, you have to be really careful what you tell them, right? And then what they need. And you know, I've studied it, so I'm I'm I don't say I'm perfect, but I can see red flags quite often. So I know, well, I know what the generally I know the limits of what a person can do and can accept and can understand. Not that they don't want to do or understand more, but I know the limits in the particular conditions they're in. So I've seen that's really helped me help them. And sometimes I'm dealing with devotees who gurus are giving them opposite instructions, and I have to tell them that I don't think you should follow that because I could see it's just damaging them psychologically because they're, they're very difficult. They've been through very difficult situations. And then, so sometimes I have to do that. I wish I didn't. I wish all the gurus understood it, but, you know, the gurus are to totally, all of them are totally qualified to give spiritual instruction, but in personal practical matters, uh, sometimes they just won't understand somebody. They never understood it or studied it. They haven't been trained in pastoral counseling. So that's another thing that's been brought up. And pastoral counseling is how to counsel, how to do therapy and counseling within the religious context of that tradition, understanding the context. So basically you're a psychotherapist, but a devotee. Well, maybe not a psychotherapist, but you're a counselor, but you understand some psychology, um, but within the context of your own tradition. So it's not secular psychotherapy. That's what pastoral counseling is. So certainly useful for all leaders, right? Maybe someday that will be a qualification for all leaders, temple presidents, GBC gurus, bhakti Viksha leaders, that they do a course in pastoral counseling. Then it would be, and then they would start to understand better how to deal with certain cases, I would think. So thank you for bringing that up. Okay. So um, Gabriel just scared us by saying that um, amongst leaders and charismatic people, mostly they're narcissistic. That's how they got there. Um, um, to assume that anyone who's in leadership position in ISKCON is narcissistic. I don't, knowing them well, seeing them, I think Krishna consciousness is 
has, even if they are, has neutralized a lot of that tendency. I mean, you could say most people are narcissistic to some degree, you know, it's narcissistic. Um, but Krishna consciousness makes you more empathetic, more compassionate, more humble. So, but, you know, it's still true. This is statistics that, um, you know, a, a lot of people who are gurus in the secular world of gurus are narcissistic. That's how they got there. They like the praise. And most most ISKCON devotees, if not all, don't like the praise. It's very un they're very uncomfortable in that position. They don't really have much of a private life. They'd like to have more. A lot of girls would just like to be ordinary devotees, but that's their service to Prabhupada. So it wasn't like they wanted to do it, you know, like I like this. So I think we're safe. We're, you know, ISKCON is it's doing quite well if you compare it to the rest of the guru world and religious world. You know, I mean, like how many cases in ISKCON are there of a disciple engaging in illicit relationships with their disciples? It practically never happens. How many cases of that are with gurus outside of ISKCON? Practically never doesn't happen. I'm serious. You know, it practically never doesn't happen. And I don't even know if it ever happened in ISKCON. Maybe once, once or twice, and they ended up marrying. But outside, I read an article and said outside, practically there practically wasn't one that they found that that didn't happen. So I think in this kind, we're, you know, we're in a good position. You know, we have Prabhupada, we have a very powerful mantra, we have Shastra, so there's hope. I don't, I don't say there's hope, but we can look at the record. It's, you know, the record is pretty good, at least compared to the outside world. So Sydney says, what about overly criticizing ourselves, always blaming self and our conditioning for everything that happens? So that's a formula for failure, favor self. I mean, if you want to be miserable and fail, keep doing it. It works, actually. That'll keep you crippled for life. If you want to be a number one loser, then now you know how to do it. Katie says, I think the worst is that he used to quote out of context to prove that it's because of my lack of sadhana or whatnot. He wrote, until you become fully Krishna conscious, you'll suffer from anxiety. The same as everyone else. I feel for you. Mat must say, if you're trying and it's still not working, try harder. That's my, um, should always be trying to improve. I was in shock for a day. Um, well, what he's saying is true for people who are you don't have the, the mental condition you have. That's my whole point. You, so I did another video and I said in the video, I said, perfect instructions, and what was the title of it like? When perfect instructions don't work. So it's a perfect instruction, it just doesn't work for you. Here, eat carrots, they're good. It make you see good, right? You ever, your mother ever say, eat carrots, good for your eyes, yeah. And I eat carrots and I get rashes. So are carrots good for me? No, I don't think so. So not every proper instruction is good for everybody, right? And we have one more and then we'll end. Sincerely speaking, a narcissistic personality is actually a pathology. We shouldn't mislead that. It's people that just need attention due to various, yeah. It is a pathology, which is pervasive. Anyway. This was an important class. And now we're going to end and do some more important things. Like chanting the holy names. Hare Krishna to everyone. Sri the Prabhupada Ki Jai. So we will continue this topic on Wednesday. And then Friday, the topic is how to make ISKCON better by you becoming better. There's no way to make it better than you becoming better. Okay. So did we end class or are we on the Japa class now? Hare right, Krishna Guru Dave, please accept my humble obeisances. Right, Jai Prabhupada. I, uh, would you like us to stop the Facebook live for the class and then start the yeah. new Japa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Right, I can keep talking. But, you know.